Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Talks with Tori episode. I am so excited to jump into the conversation with my girlfriend, Kristen. If you listen to episode one, you will know that I have admired Kristen. She has inspired me and impacted me for so many years years since before I ever met her. Um, And then she's had such a personal impact on my life when we became close friends in my season in LA. So I'm very excited for you guys to hear the conversation that we have. Um, But before we jump into all of that, I just want to quickly remind you guys, if you are loving this podcast, don't forget to give it a rating. That way more people can find it. Or if you're loving the episodes, make sure to share it with a friend. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, to like, to do all the things. It means more than you know to me. Um, and so, yes, before we jump into the conversation in true toxitory fashion, I just want to share a little bit of what God's been teaching me, what he's placed on my heart and hopes that it encourages you in some way. Um, so I'm going to actually be reading out of Samuel. It is first Samuel 16, seven, and it says the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And I think something that the Lord's really been teaching me is that it's the things that you do and say in the unseen, like the things that other people do not see that are actually the most important. And the only person in the Bible who the Lord said was a man after his heart was David. And even David felt like overlooked at some point in time. And I want to read a little excerpt that I found from this devotional because I feel like it really summed up what I'm learning very well. And so it says, does what I do really matter? So if you're out there and you're like, I don't know if what I'm doing is making any impact. Like, I don't feel like anyone's seeing what I'm doing. Is the Lord even seeing what I'm doing? Does any of it even matter? When God told Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel, Samuel met with Jesse and his sons. Each of Jesse's sons appeared to have the qualities of a good king, but God didn't choose any of them. Jesse said that there was one son left, David, who was watching the sheep. At that time, shepherds were considered unclean and dirty, which is probably why David wasn't originally invited. But although others overlooked him, God chose David to lead Israel. Even when David was unseen, God saw him just like he sees you now. If God can use David, an ordinary shepherd, to do amazing things, then he can use you too. What you do when no one is looking is shaping you into what God made you to be and preparing you for the plans he has for you. Just like David, continue to diligently put your faith in God. Today, spend some time connecting with God who sees you, loves you, and values you. And I just think that that's so good because I feel like so often we can just question, like, is what I'm doing really important? Like, does God see this? Do people see this? And I think it's in the unseen that God does the most. And that's what we should be praying for. Like, God, I want to be like David. I want to be a woman after your own heart. And what does that look like? Y'all, that means pursuing God's heart. We cannot have a, a heart like God if we don't know God's heart, if we're not pressing into his presence, if we're not seeking him, if we're not asking him, if we're not inquiring of him, if we're not listening to him, then how are we supposed to be women or men like God, right? Like a a heart like his. And so that's been my prayer lately. Like, God, would you make me a woman after your own heart? Would you reveal the things in me that 
are not like you, that are not glorifying to you. And in that process, God has revealed some things that I'm not proud of, that I, I don't like, that don't feel like me. And then sometimes I'm like, wait, God, I don't like this process. I don't want to see these things. Can we push them back down? Like, that's ugly. I don't like that. But if we have a different perspective in the process, we can thank him for revealing those aspects of us that we don't necessarily like because it is part of the process, right? Like, okay, God, you've revealed it. Now you can remove it, like remove this from my life. Like, I don't want to struggle with this thing anymore that I know is not from you. Help me create a strategy to pray against it. Help me create a strategy to look more like you. And so anyways, I hope that encouraged you. And now let's just jump on into the conversation with my girlfriend, Kristen. Okay, y'all, I am with my girl, Kristen. And if y'all watched the first episode, I was talking to you guys about how I fangirled over Kristen the first time that she actually reposted a story of mine. And then- (laughs) <laughs> we became friends in LA and was part of her women's ministry called She Gathers. And it was just, I look back at that season, Kristen, and it was like one of the sweetest seasons of my life. And you were such a huge part of that. And part of the reason, like why I developed such amazing friends with women of God. So I just want to honor you before we even jump in just for being obedient to the call of God because it's not easy to start something like that to I feel like I and I'm not sure and you know what I'll just go ahead and ask you what was it like living in LA and deciding to start a women's ministry where it's not just online like it's like will you come meet with me you know what I mean where you almost have the fear of like is anyone actually going to show up (laughs) Oh, no, I totally did. Um, Yeah, I felt like God, I I felt like he was calling me to start a women's group for a while. And there was this one night I was in the school of ministry and someone gave me a prophetic word that it was time for me to, like I had been in hiding and it was time for me to step into the spotlight yeah. And I knew what that meant. I knew that meant it was time for me to start this women's group. Yeah. And so I did. And um the not not really people were just more consistent. And I was putting yeah. so much effort into it. I was like, Yeah, you know what? You're I don't all think I'm ready nothing. for this. Yeah. 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 I was like, I don't think I'm ready for this. And so then my friend Shandy, who's a former Miss USA, and she was also the head judge when I competed in Miss USA. And I'm just saying that because it's really cool how like, I just feel like how God places people in your life and they have Mm -hmm. sort of like a a theme purpose in your life. Um, And she's been one of those people. And so she called me and she's like, Hey, um, we need a Bible study leader at our church. Uh, and none of the women currently in the Bible study are willing to sign the morality contract. (laughs) Wow. Wait, really? What does that mean? Wait, what was on this contract that they didn't want to sign? The main thing that there were two main things. One of them was you can't cohabitate before you're married. Yeah. You Uh can't live with your boyfriend. And the other one Uh was premarital sex. Yeah. There it is. And, uh, both of those, I, I was like, check, check, you know? Yeah. You're like, I'm and um, she's like, so I'm going to let you pray about it, but I already know the answer is yes. And I was like, okay. So I ended up leading, I ended up leading that Bible study. And that was a really good, like transition into leading women yeah. because I had a built in group. I didn't have to like, right. you just kind of stepped people. into it. Right. Exactly. Thank you. I just stepped into it. And then I ended up leading that group for four years and it was such a, um, just a, like a training phase, Mm -hmm. you know? So this is before the Bible study that I was a part of. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Completely different group. And I just realized as I led that, like, so there was just a lot I really needed to learn as Mm -hmm. as far as just like how to manage a group and how to lead well. So then I really felt the stirring that there there just needed to be more like this was a strictly a study of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I was really wanting to lead women in their identity, 
yeah. learning how to seek the gifts of the spirit, like operate yeah. in the gift of prophecy and yeah. praying over each other and things like that. So that's when I started my women's group at my house. And um, yeah, it was just really, really beautiful and special. And then after a couple of years, more people wanted to join but we just didn't have the capacity or the dynamic. Like that wasn't yeah. the vibe. Like we weren't trying yes. to do like a big open group every week. It was a right. very like intimate, special, small, like it was a, co- a group, a covenant group, yeah. you know? And when you're in covenant with each other, you can't just like bring new fresh blood in that you don't, there's been no like built trust yet. So, um, so that's when we transitioned to the monthly format that we're currently in, uh, which we call She Gathers. So, yeah, yeah it, was, it was fun. Like, just to answer your question, like, what was it like? I mean, it was uh, it was really just special. Yeah. I feel like you really did create such an intimate atmosphere. And I think that's something that I respected so much because it can be very easy as a leader to almost, like, want the numbers, to, to feel like the more people, the more – um, impact you're having or like the greater, I don't know, purpose for the kingdom, but there's something so special and like the intimate group, because I'm, re- I remember sharing things that were super personal to me that I would not have felt comfortable sharing had it not been an intimate group, had it not been like people that I knew you trusted that I learned to trust. And it is so beautiful when you can do life and community with other women believers. Um, and I have a question because, um, I tend to, and you know this about me, um, struggle sometimes when women are like in relationships that you from the outside perspective, like, no, they shouldn't be in, like you can see all the red flags, but they, (laughs) are like blinders on, you know, like the whole, like love is blind. And how do you go about that sometimes? Because I have genuinely, I will say this, like lost friendships because (laughs) I get so upset that they don't understand their worth and like they're putting Mm -hmm. up with things that I'm just like, you cannot let him treat you this way. Like, this is not it friend. This is not it. And I've literally like lost a friend because of it, because I just like, could not sit back and like watch her go through this over and over and over again. Um, and I just saw on your Instagram, like you've been posting so much about relationships and dating and everything lately. And I feel like there's like this new passion and fire. And so I'd love for you to first and foremost, talk about how you navigate that with a friend, like in like sharing truth, but also it being in a loving, gentle way because I know that there's girls listening that are in this position because I have gotten so many DMs where it's like my friend is in a terrible relationship and I don't know how to tell her without being like that friend and it's so hard and I like recognize that it's so hard to just like bite your tongue sometimes and go to the Lord in prayer about it but um what advice do you have for that girl oh my gosh okay (laughs) Um, there's so many things. So first of all, I feel like I really, um, same, same as you had a, a very close person in my life who I very strongly disapproved of the relationship. Yeah. And we, so we became estranged in our relationship for like over five years because wow. of it. Yeah. Because they were into a long-term relationship. Like I lost that relationship with that special person. Mm. Um, and so I think I really learned through that, like, okay, you, you need to be a little bit just more careful in mm-hmm. how you handle things. So the first thing is it depends on how close you are with the person. Yeah. Like, do you have a right to speak into their life? Mm-hmm. The second thing is, do they want to hear your advice? Yeah. You know, like sometimes they have a heart ready to receive. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, and sometimes people will be like, what do you think about this boy? And you, Mm -hmm. your response should be, do you want to know what I really think? Or do you want to know what you want to hear? Yeah. You know, like you, they like almost like preface it because they need to, 
they need to take ownership of the fact that they just invited your opinion in. Right. That's true. <laughs> All that's right. True. So that's like number two or three. And then number four is when you tell them a hard truth, and this just, this just goes for anything, are you willing to walk alongside them after you tell them the hard thing? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, because if you're going to tell someone like, hey, this person is not for you, like, come on, who have you become? How, you know, yeah. you need to break up with him. Are you going to be the person who's going to also be there for them in the breakup aftermath? Yeah. And what if they don't break up? Like you've stated your opinion and they're very aware of where you stand, but they're like, Hey, I appreciate your advice, but I'm not going to take it. How then do you navigate the relationship? Like when they're talking to you about him and they're sharing like the good stuff, but you're like, I still do not approve. Do you just kind of keep your mouth shut at that point? Because like you've yep. stated what you need to state and then just resort to prayer because I feel yeah. like that's kind of what I've had to do in the past where it's like, okay, you know exactly where I stand when it comes to this. And so my advice always is like, if you've already stated what you have to state, then your biggest battle plan should be prayer for this person's eyes to be open, that they can see through God's eyes and not a blurred lens um, but it doesn't make it easy to just like yeah. stand by and watch. I, I agree. I think that's, I love what you said. I mean, I have, I know of situations and friends who their take on it is, well, I can't be friends with that person because I don't approve right. of their relationship. Mm -hmm. And so they just like completely disengage. And that would not be my advice. Um, yeah. I really like your approach as far as like be honest and authentic in yeah. a gentle way. Yeah. Then they've heard it already. They've already decided not to listen. Cool. That's on them. Right. Um, and then from that point on, like you can still engage in friendship. And when they do talk about so-and-so, you just nod and smile. Oh, yeah. good. Great. Awesome. Like they know. Yeah. You know, they know and, then, yeah. and then they're going to still feel like you're trustworthy. And when mm -hmm. stuff does hit the fan, they know you'll be, to to. you'll be the person that they call because you didn't leave yeah. them. Right. You know, yeah, that's so good. And what do you feel like for the girl out there who like low key does know she's in the wrong relationship, but she's questioning or fearful of like the aftermath, you know, like I know that I'm not quite. I know that I don't feel peace about this, but I also just don't want to go through a breakup, right? Or she's like struggling with the lies of, well, I'll never do better. You know, like how do you coach women to actually understand their value and their worth inside of a relationship? Because that's one thing that I always struggle with when I see this is I'm like, man, I think a lot of it comes down to you not understanding your identity in Christ and what you're actually worth because, and I only say that cause I've been there where I have not understood my identity in Christ. I have not understood my worth. And so I put up with things that I should have never put up with because of that, like lack of knowledge. And well, so what advice would you have for the girl who's listening? And she has that like inkling inside of her that like, man, I know this isn't right but yeah. is struggling well, with the fear or the courage to actually put a stop to it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that question, Tori. And I feel like a lot of women are in that place. Yeah. Um, I found myself in that exact same place with the boyfriend before I met my husband, Chris. Yeah. And we had a good relationship. We had a great friendship, but I, I didn't feel adored. I didn't feel cherished. I didn't feel treasured. Those are three yeah. key words. I felt like we were pals. Mm. I felt like we were friends. I remember one time going to uh, CVS, look for a birthday card. And I looked through all these like romantic cards and, and messages. Not and I was like, no, like none of these yeah. match. And that's like, oh my gosh, is this what I, what I want? Is this what right. I was made for, for the rest of my life? Yeah. And um, I had this this night where I read a devotion by Joyce Meyer and, and the, um, 
devotional called The Confident Woman for anyone who needs a great Devo. That's an awesome one. And I opened up to a page called Do It Afraid. And it was about doing the thing that you know you need to do even though you're afraid. Right. And that honestly just answered all my hard questions of, okay, what if I never meet a guy who really is what I believe would look like is God's best for me. And I felt like God in that moment was like, you'll never know. You'll never know if you were wrong or if you were right, if you stay in, in a place of settling. Right. Yeah. So I was like, well, I have to find out, but I'm never going to know if I marry this guy, you know, and I'll always wonder one of the best pieces of advice that my favorite psychology professor gave in regards to a good marriage was choose wisely. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're either your greatest asset or your greatest liability. Like that's what, um, I think it was Rich Wilkerson or Don Sheree Wilkerson said, and I was in the middle of the wrong relationship and it didn't necessarily have to do with me wondering if that person cared about me, but it was a, it was our callings don't match. Like we are not going in the same direction. Like God is calling me here and you are somewhere totally left field. And this does not align at all. And I think that what you brought up as well is like that fear component of like doing it afraid when the Bible says like, I have not given you a spirit of fear And yet so often we allow fear to dictate our decisions where it's like, I'm not breaking up with him out of fear. And I'm like, so I'm staying in this relationship based on fear, like versus the peace of the Lord. Like in what world does that make sense? Right? Because every time I follow the peace of the Lord, there is fruitfulness and there is joy and there is an abundance. And yet every time I follow fear, then I'm stuck and I'm like not in the right place at all. And I miss out on so much that God has. And so, yeah, for that girl who's in that place, I think what Kristen said is so good because it's like, man, you don't want to look back five years from now and ask that question, what if I had have just obeyed God? Like I, man, that is the worst feeling ever is like when I hear the beckoning of the Holy Spirit or I hear that still small voice and I am not quick to obey. I mean, even in the small things in life, like literally yesterday, I, my, my baby wakes up pretty early. Um, he's like a 6am wake upper and, um, I woke up at 5.15 just like randomly and I felt the Holy Spirit say, will you come meet with me? Like I woke you up early. Will you come meet with me? And I immediately questioned it and I'm like, I know the Lord wants me to get some sleep too. Like sleep is also important for me to like function, right? And it was just that and I drifted back off to sleep. Like it was literally like a five second conversation wake up and then I drifted back into sleep. In the entire day, I was so upset because I was like, what did I miss? Like, I like knew that I missed out on like quality, quiet time with the Holy Spirit because like I was not quick to obey. And it like goes back to, I'm like, my mom used to tell me that as a kid, like be quick to obey. Like, and I'm sure you say that as a mom too. It's like, it's so easy for us to like almost navigate. Like, well, God will ask me again later. You know what I mean? Like I'll say, I'll say yes next time, but it's like, how often do we miss out on like what God has for us? Because we're not quick to obey him. I'm like, man, he asked me how to man. get out of that relationship for years before I actually did. What did I miss out on? That's good, girl. I love that. It's funny because, um, so Atlas, my four-year-old just started TK And the teacher sent home a questionnaire and she's like, what do you really hope your child learns this year? And the one thing that I wrote was (laughs) I want him to learn how to be quick to obey. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It's it's like, I'm like, friends, that would be great. But honestly, I just want him to learn how to listen and do it. (laughs) How? Okay. So something else that I've watched you do so well is walk in different seasons of motherhood in so many different ways where like when I met you, 
you just had Aurora and now you're a mom of three. And I feel like in different seasons, you were like, okay, right now I know this is my season for women's ministry and mommy, and this is this. Yeah. But then I've yeah. also seen you be like, this is my season to just be mom. And now I'm watching you walk in a slightly different season where you're like, I'm still crushing the mom game, but I'm also really pursuing my passions and my business and everything that God has for me separately just as Kristen. And so I'm curious, like what your process is with the Lord? Like, what do you hear from him where you're like, okay, I know that like, this is what my focus is supposed to be in this season, because I know that I struggle with this a lot because working mom, right? Like we have childcare right now, so we can afford this uh, to do this podcast. And I'm sure you have to do the same. So how have you navigated that balance? And like, do you ever struggle with mom guilt because of it? Or yeah, I just, I'm very curious. Well, first of all, that is so sweet that you notice my different seasons. <laughs> um, very true. And um, I, the transition of the, the transition part is always hard, you know, yeah. like that where you're feeling like, okay, something is uh, suffering, mm -hmm. you know, like either the children are suffering because they're not getting enough quality time or like I'm burnt out from ministry or yeah. not loving coaching or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And so that's when I feel like, you know, God is like, all right, let's, let's make a change. Mm -hmm. Um, when, in regards to process, it really is just spending time with God. It's yeah. really just quality time. And, uh, and when I say that, I mean like the Bible reading that I do, yeah. the devotions that I'm reading, the podcast I'm listening to, like, I will notice that there is a, a through line or a theme that's like popping out or speaking to me through mm -hmm. lots of different messages or in my prayer time or in something I'm already feeling. Yeah. And that kind of lets me know, like, I feel like God is saying this. Right. Yeah. And then what did you ask me after that? Well, just how have you navigated? Like, so you have three kids, right? And you're still like a working mom. And so and how have you navigated like that balance in terms of like, is it easy for you? I think what I'm trying to say is sometimes it's hard for me to switch from work mm. to mom. And I don't know if it's mm. different in coaching because you're like, okay, I'm in a session and then I can turn it off. And a lot of what we do is social media. So it feels like it's so hard to turn it off sometimes right. where I feel like, oh, I'm posting something real quick. And now Micah wants my phone because that's what mommy's holding. Right. And it's like, he doesn't know that this is work. Um, but then I need to put this away and play with him and be present. But then I'm also thinking, okay, what do I have going on later on today? And so sometimes I'm, I struggle with like being present in the moment and like what I'm doing and not allowing my mind to like constantly have a million things running through it because I want to be present in each thing, but I find it so difficult sometimes. Yes. I definitely remember feeling really frustrated, um, in moments like that, because you're right. Like when it comes to social media and that being a big aspect of your job, and even though social media isn't my job, it's yeah. a really big part of it. Cause if Absolutely. I don't show up online, then like, People don't know Where what do I do or clients. who I am. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So, yeah, I, I definitely remember feeling that frustration and then that I would take out my frustration on my children and then I would feel resentful of them. Wow. Yeah. So now I'm really, um, we have a really good flow. Time blocking is the key. Okay. And yeah. I have full-time help now. That's amazing. Good yes. for you. <laughs> um, but, but time blocking. So all of, and I'm also going to be a master's in marriage and family therapy. So I'm like doing Incredible. school and coaching. Wow. Um, and so my work hours are nine to one, 9am to 1pm. Yeah. And then after that, I'm like, everything gets turned off. Like no more, nothing. If I didn't queue up my social media, like that morning or at nighttime, like it's not getting posted. 
That's so um, good. I don't want my children to see me on my phone and yeah. I don't want them to be a trying to talk to me and me and, being like, hold on, let me get make this post up real quick. Sometimes yeah. I still do that, yeah. but I really, I don't do any scrolling or engaging um, once they're home from school. It's just like, I really want to have that quality time and I, I want, I want to have fun with them and I want them to think that I'm have like feel yeah, that I'm having to fun feel with them. that. Yeah. To feel like, yeah. like I don't want them to be like time with me. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I really believe the notion that what you learn is caught more than it's taught. Mm, yeah. So I have a lot yeah. of really good things to say. I have some great yeah. wisdom and advice that I can teach my children. Yeah. But they're going to see you living it. More. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to catch, I'm going to replicate who I am. And uh, so I need to be very vigilant. So that's, that's really, and I really do turn off. Like when coaching is over, it's, it's over. It's done. Yeah. I feel like yeah. that's something that Chad and I, like we need to get to that place. You know what I mean? Where we have figured out and we've tried like new schedules. We've tried so much. I mean, we, you obviously know daily podcasts, now this podcast and two YouTube videos a week on top of that. Like there's a lot of content that we're like constantly trying to navigate and push out to encourage people, et cetera. And sometimes it really is so hard to kind of like just turn it off. Right. Um, but I do feel mm -hmm. like that's something that God has really been challenging us with now in being parents, because we can tell even my, he's nine months old. Right. And I can tell the difference in his mood if I'm on my phone versus if I'm playing with him. Like he's more fussy if I'm like trying to do something on my phone and he doesn't have my full blown attention than if I'm not. Right. And so I'm like, man, this is only going to get more intense. And so like, I've got to figure out ways to like really navigate work while he's napping and time blocking to where, okay, we, we need help for this many hours. That way we can do podcasts, et cetera. Um, and then actually just be so fully present with him when he's Maybe. awake, because I do think it's just, it's so easy to get so distracted on social media and you like, I'll get on to do something productive and then I'll realize I'm scrolling and I'm like, what am I even doing? Like how, how did this just happen? Like, it's such a trap sometimes where I'm like, yeah, man, which is, it, 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 that's exactly how it's set up. Like, I it's know it's literally built that way. On that one. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Another question. I'm so curious. What was your biggest like transition? So three kids, was it the biggest transition from like zero to one, one to two or two to three? Like what was the most shocking to your system? Zero to one. Okay. I love that. Yeah. That makes yeah. it feel great. Cause that's what Chad and I, Chad and I say, we're like, I don't think anything will quite shake us like the zero to one because yeah, your time is no longer your own. Your body as a woman is like no longer your own and you can't travel or make plans or like anything like you were used to doing. And so I always love to ask my girlfriends who have multiple children. I'm like, what was the biggest transition? Yeah. And I feel like there's, there's different answers. Like there's, I, like there are some moms who are like, it was one to two because one was so blissful and happy for them. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if it was a harder, like, oh, like if it was a big shock for you, zero to one, yeah. then one to two is going to be easier. Right. But if it was like bliss, zero yeah. to one, then one yeah. to two is going to be harder. <laughs> okay. Yeah. See, I, I, I've said this before on the podcast, but I feel like the zero to one, like the first couple months, I say they were beautifully brutal. Because there was beauty, like there's so much beauty in it, but it was also brutal. Like I was like, Micah was colicky, right? Like we weren't sleeping. Like he literally well, would not sleep anywhere else, but on my chest for the uh, first like four months. And so like, I did not sleep at all and no. trying to operate in that and still work, which I made the terrible mistake of not taking like any maternity leave at all. And, um, yeah, <laughs> I did that same thing. Why? Cause I, Why I do like, we do this? Yeah. Well, I think when you're self-employed, you just don't think about that. Yeah. Cause you're like, well, I'm at home. Like I'll be fine. Yeah. I can do yeah. that. 
Like I literally was recording daily devotional podcasts, like wild nursing Micah, because it was not on camera yet at that point in time. And it would be like so late and all the things. And I'm like, I don't even know what I just said because I'm like actually <laughs> delusional at this point. Cause I've yeah. not had any sleep at all. Like praise the Lord for the Holy spirit that like speaks through you. Um, but no, I feel like that first transition was it's wild. It's like a little wild. You're like, okay. Like even to this day, I'm like, oh, my friend has um, a really fun dinner this, this next week, like end of summer, you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh, like I'm gonna have to get a, I'm gonna have to get like someone to watch the monitor, like get Micah down before. Like there's so much to think about when making plans now. Um, but I feel like you as a mom, like you still maintained such a good social life and like ministry life. And yeah, I think that it's just an inspiration to me to be like, your life does not like stop. You know what I mean? Like, cause I think it's very easy as women to just completely stop. Now I think there's seasons, right? Like where this might not be my season for as much girl time as I was used to before Micah, right? Like my season now is stewarding the blessing that I prayed for, for years, you know, like being fully in this season too, but then still navigating, you know, later like, oh, well, but I'm still Tori and I still have need for community and I still have need for girl time. I still have need for like intentional time with my husband. And that way I can be a better mom. You know, because I think so often I get caught in the trap of like, well, if I take this time away from my child, then I have like guilt about it versus like, well, if I take this time, I'm going to actually show up as a better mom later because I'm now like filled up, you know? No, I love that. I think that's so good. Um, we, We hear a lot of messaging that says like women can do it all, like you can do it all. And I think that is sounds really empowering. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds really empowering and exciting, but it ends up being incredibly enslaving. Yeah. And I think what's actually true is we're not meant to do it all. We're meant to do our call. Ooh, that's so good. What we are specifically called to do and Mm -hmm. who we're called to be, like you said, season by season. Because it does evolve and it does change. And like the way we operate in one season isn't going to be how we operate in another season. And so I think just normalizing that Mm -hmm. and uh, realizing like, ooh, a transition is happening. A transition is coming. And realizing that like you, in order to succeed in that season, Mm -hmm. you need to make your priorities. Like these are my three main priorities. Mm -hmm. And everything else is kind of like if I'm able to do it, after these three priorities are met. Yeah. Good. If not, then I'm going to sleep. Yeah. And I feel like you're, you're more of a type a person, right? Like you love a schedule, love a plan. I love a schedule. I love a plan, but I don't know if I'm type a, I I wish I were more type a, I think I would be more successful if I were more type a, no, I think I can be one way or the other. I think I can be like either really like intense or really like if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm not intense, then I'm kind of like, la, 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 like a little <laughs> floppy. <laughs> I, I feel like I will make these insane to-do lists and then I will be so hard on myself that I did not get every single thing done and I will be defeated at the end of the day. And Chad's like, Chad gets on to me all the time. And he was like, well, first and foremost, that to-do list was not realistic in the slightest. And I'm like, valid point valid point. And so I have to figure out like how to do what you're saying, where it's like these three things, like if these three things get done today, amazing. It's a good day. It's a good day. And if these six things underneath don't get done today, like they will get done. Right. And so I'm like, I've got to stop doing that to myself where I literally just put so much on my to-do list. And I'm like, then left defeated because I don't, know how to prioritize what I need to prioritize, or I've just put way too much on our plate in general. And I'm like, cause sometimes I'm like, well, all of this actually does need to get done. Like it actually needs to all get done. And there's not enough hours in the day to like do all of this and be a mom and like do what I need to do. And then also like rest, you know, clean the kitchen, clean the the dishes, put them away, Mm -hmm. take the trash out. Like those things are like, is someone else going to do this? Like, 
Yes. I don't have time to do the dishes. <laughs> I like really don't want to do the dishes. Like, how is laundry going to move me forward in my goals for life? I will say laundry is actually my least favorite chore of all of them. Oh, God. It takes forever. There's so many steps. If there's so many steps, the separation, the putting it together. I'm always well, nervous that something's going to shrink because honestly, so many things shrink and I get so upset by it. I'm like, I put this on extra low. Like it was extra low heat. How in the world did this shrink? And yeah, so I like have anxiety around laundry sometimes. Like that is not a chore that brings me joy. That is a chore that I literally dread. I'm like the the sink, the dishes, at least there's like a, um, like after you do them, they never take quite as long as you think they're going to take. And then it's a clean sink and it's like satisfying. Cause I'm like, yeah. now everything feels a little bit more clean in the kitchen. I don't see the dirty dishes. The laundry is kind of like out of sight, out of mind. I'm like, sometimes I don't feel like doing the laundry until I literally don't have another pair of underwear. And I'm like, now I literally am forced to do laundry because I have no more underwear to wear. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that your least no. favorite or do you have a, a, a chore that's worse? No, it's definitely, definitely yeah. my least favorite. Yeah, sure. laundry is actually the worst ever. Okay, so outside of laundry, I feel like we have been talking forever and we have not scratched the surface. Like, we could talk for another four hours. Um, <laughs> but I want to know, because I know that you have such a beautiful intimacy and alone time with the Lord, and he's always teaching you something. Um, what do you feel like he's teaching you right now? Like, in this season, what is he kind of revealing to you? Because I want to mm. learn yeah a few things um i'm trying to decide which one which one i want to go with i would say i don't think that we give um what happens in the spiritual realm enough credit or attention yeah and when i say the spiritual realm i don't mean just like what's happening outside of us i mean also what happens within us and what gets attached to us Mm. so it says out of the heart the mouth speaks Mm -hmm. um and it talks about uh how we should not be double-minded in the bible uh so what does that mean double-minded it's like okay it's like when people say i know it but i just i don't feel it it hasn't dropped down yeah from the head and the reason why is because yeah it hasn't gone from the head to the heart exactly so Uh, the reason why is because we've had like repeated patterns over and over again because of a certain trigger. Like for me, uh, in the area of rejection. And so like, let's say something happened to you when you were seven years old, where you, um, believe like someone made you feel rejected Mm -hmm. and that person, um, that person, like, that person like affected you, not just them and the flesh and the flesh and the yeah. like flesh and blood. Mm-hmm. It says that we, the battle that we're in is not, okay. not between flesh and blood, mm-hmm. but in the spirit. Yeah. And, uh, so sometimes like something dark will get on you and in you and it will latch on. Yeah. So like, I've just been really like leaning into, um, how we can almost like, like a trauma or a wound yeah. will open up a pattern of negative thinking and it can be fueled by a demonic entity. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have strongholds and can be enslaved to something. And it starts to manifest in different ways. Like, um, for instance, if you struggle with, uh, reactivity or anger or rage, um, and it's not willful, like you don't want to do it. It almost like overtakes you. And you're like, what is this? This this is not who I want to be. Mm-hmm. Like, chances are it's not just you. Right. Chances are, like, you have a, a, a great opportunity to possibly cast out yeah. a, a spirit of darkness that's gotten a hold of you. That um, reminds me, have you ever read the book This Present Darkness? No. I feel like you would love that book if this is something that you are currently kind of working through with the Lord because... I have not read it, but Chad has read it. And from what he shares with me, it's literally about this where like oh. um, the, the demons have like different assignments over different cities and different people. And 
like they will literally have a name. Like there's a spirit of anger over this person and that's why they're struggling with this thing. And it like takes you through this journey and this story. And like, apparently it is an incredible book about like the spiritual warfare that exists that we are so unaware of sometimes. Um, and I always pray like, Lord, give me the eyes to see what I need to see spiritually so that I can go to battle in the way I need to go to battle. Like even when I'm praying over Micah every single night, I like pray against any attack over the enemy. I like cast out any darkness that might be in the room trying to attack my son. I pray for like the Holy spirit to abound in that room for peace to surround them or peace to surround him. And honestly, it gives me peace and any night that I don't feel like I've really like gone to battle for him as I'm rocking him to sleep I will walk out of the room and be like "Mm, nope that was not enough and like I will even like go back in there and be like okay we're gonna continue praying because I just feel like there when there's an assignment that the Lord has placed on your life there's also an assignment from the enemy right like where he has assigned darkness to try to attack the very thing that you are called to do. And so this is what we say, like when Christians think that they are, when they become a Christian, they're like, oh, life should be easier now. It's like, no, no, actual opposite. Cause now you have a target on your back because the Lord is calling you to something, which means that there is going to be a tax against it. And so having to like work past those things. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about a war room and a prayer strategy is because we need scripture to surround different areas of our life over our children, over our marriage, over our community, over our city, over our country. Like we need to have a strategy in place because we fight spiritual battles, not physical battles. And I think when we don't have the eyes to see spiritually, we will suffer physically because we're not fighting the right way. We're not using the right weapons. And so that's so good. I feel like I could we could talk about spiritual warfare for such a long time because uh, do you feel like there was like something specific that made you feel like this is something that I want to look into? Like, was there a specific thing that you felt like you were wrestling with? Uh, yeah, I've totally had a uh, like, um, <laughs> this sounds like so insane. Every time I say it to people, they start laughing and I'm like, I, I don't understand it. why you're laughing. Yeah, I want to hear um, it. So I'm like, am I the only person? Um, I just, I have like a really bad problem with cussing. Really? Not anymore. I've been delivered. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I've rarely ever heard you cuss and I've spent a ton of time with you. (laughs) Well, praise the Lord. Um, But yeah, it was like really getting out of control. And it was like, um, honestly, just felt like it... um, it was unwillful. It was yeah, just like it just kept happening. Do you feel like it was because of anything you were watching? Because I've noticed with me, if I watch a particular show, I will start mimicking behaviors or like ways they talk. And it's like not good. So I have to be very careful about what I watch. I do too. Yeah. I do too. I no, so I the cussing was not that. I barely watch anything. I barely watch anything. So that yeah. Because of that, exactly what you're talking about. I'm very yeah. sensitive. Yeah. Um, but what was I going to say? Yeah. So I was like, you know, I, I literally did so many things um, to help myself. And I'm a life coach and a mental yeah. health coach and like a performance coach. Like I know right. how to break habits, you know. Yeah. And this just wasn't like none of my little techniques were working. Mm. Um, and I was like, I f- it's just something more. Yeah. You know, I really feel like it's demonic. Yeah. Um, and through the summer, God was just speaking to me like through different, like different ways. Mm-hmm. And finally, and I felt like he was kind of doing this like process of like, it's almost like of deliverance, really. Mm-hmm. It was layered. And I just felt like the hold that it had on me was uh, loosening, loosening, and it had was having less of a hold. And then finally, um, I listened to this podcast that was like, I just stumbled upon that was like how to deliver yourself from demons. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds so crazy and scary, but like, I yeah. want to hear, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I was listening and basically you're like, you 
you're um, breaking and releasing like mm-hmm. different spirits, like you were talking about, like the right. names of different like entities. Right. And once I got and it was all like neutral, neutral as, as, as I was declaring and decreeing. And then once I got to this one part about um, breaking and releasing like negative uh, agreement, agreements that I'd made with negative words spoken over me and that I'd spoken over myself, I started like hyperventilating, crying, not because I was sad, but it was just like, I was like manifesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, just started like coughing, kind of like dry heaving. And, um, and I was like on a walk during this and, uh, and where I ended up, I was like shaking. I sat down and I was crying and just like thanking God. Wow. And I looked on, on one side and it said dead end. And I felt like God was saying like, we're done. It's dead. It's like, it's over. Wow. You know? Yeah. You're not going to go back. And then on the other side of me was a street sign that said sunshine. Oh, and like, that's what I've been wanting. And, yeah. and like, I'm like, I want to feel like myself again. Like I felt like a part of me like kind of died. Um, when I had my first baby. And there's, there are like just different like little things that happen along the way that triggered stuff that I yeah. do believe was like spiritual. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that is crazy it was. because so, I would always describe you as sunshine. No, oh, I would like, yeah. that's like, you are like the most glittery, you know, just like sparkly angel, you know, like you are well, sunshine. You like walk into a room and you bring joy. Like there, there are people that like walk into a room and the atmosphere doesn't shift. And then there are people like you where you walk into a room and it does shift. Like there's something that shifts in your presence. And so I think that's so cool. And I think it's an encouragement for anyone who is struggling with something that they're like, man, I don't feel like this is me. Like this does not feel like something that I would struggle with. Like for me recently when we were traveling, Micah was having a very, very hard time sleeping and I'd gotten used to him sleeping through the night and he was waking up like multiple times through the night and not just like going right back down as I would try to come for him. He would be awake for like an hour and a half and like towards the hour mark, I felt myself actually struggling with like anger and I'm like, yeah, this is not a struggle for me. Like, why am I struggling with anger right now? Like, this is not an emotion I'm used to feeling like. I normally go, like, if I get upset, like, I'm crying. (laughs) It's, like, on a scale. It's, like, mm, I go overwhelmed, cry. Upset, cry. Really happy, cry. Like, I'm a crier, right? It just on the scale. Like, if I'm, like, a four to a seven, I'm I'm good. But anything other than that, I'm normally crying. And I, like, felt angry. I'm, like, why is nothing I'm doing working? I am praying. I am singing over this child. Like, I am... I'm feeding him like I'm doing everything I know in my power to do to comfort him. And yet he was screaming like I was trying to kill him. And I was like getting so frustrated. And it's something that I had to like bring to the Lord because I'm like, Lord, this is not one of the emotions that I feel like I've ever struggled with. But in reality, like it must be somewhere in here because it, it rose to the surface. Like it must be something that's actually there, something that actually triggered it. Like whether it's just, I can't control it or whatever it is. And the anger rose up. But I do feel like when those certain things rise up to the surface, the Lord's like, perfect. I can do something now. Like if we don't know that it even exists and the Lord can't do anything with it because it has not yet been revealed, but once it is revealed, it can be restored. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, like you've revealed this is something that I actually might struggle with that I didn't know that I struggle with. And so, okay, just like in the process of like refining gold, how like the impurities have to come up in the midst of the fire, right? It's like, okay, so I'm in the fire and my impurity has now rose up to the surface, God. Like, can you please sweep it away? <laughs> can you sweep this away? Um, and I love that analogy because it's like once those things have been swept away, like the gold maker knows that the gold is good because he can see his reflection in the gold. And so I try to always think about like as these things rise up to the surface to not like beat myself up because I can I can do that sometimes of like, 
why am I struggling with this, Tori? You're better than this. Like, this is not something yeah. that you should struggle with. You're a good Christian girl, right? And, um, but God's like, this is my process to yeah. where I want to see myself in you. Like, I want to see the sanctification work to the, to the point where my image is reflected in you. And I'm like, okay, God. And it brings me peace. And it reminds That's me so of like, like, I'm such a work in progress. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I will continue to be a work in progress until the day I meet Jesus. And there are things that he will continue revealing that are not cute, that are impure, that are things that he wants to wipe away and remove. And, yeah. and it'll make me a better mom. And it'll make me a better wife. Because like as this process continues, even though it feels brutal sometimes to like be in the fiery furnace. It's like, God's like, this is where I do my best work. It's like when you actually recognize that you are so far from perfect. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Woo. Man, he gives me so many chances every day for that. <laughs> yes. Awesome. I love what you said though. I, I love the phrase that says that, oh wait, I came up with this. <laughs> uh, that you, or your emotions should inform you, not yeah. consume you. Yes. And I felt like God has brought me to a place recently where I've been able to actually like start walking in what that feels like. Yeah. And it's like the emotion comes up, like I start yeah. to feel the anger or the irritation and I'm, and then I'm like, okay, I'm irritated. Then I put it away. Right. And I'm like, all right, now I'm going to address the thing that is wrong mm -hmm. with logic and compassion. Yes. Like yeah. I don't have to use my emotions to control the situation. Right. Yeah. No, that's so good. Cause I feel like we live in a world that is driven by our feelings driven by, Oh, well I feel this way. So it must be true. And it's like, mm, no, <laughs> the Bible actually says our heart is like the most deceitful thing. So we should make sure that it stays in check and make it obedient to Christ. Um, and so that's something that I, again, continually learn because it's so easy to be driven by those emotions to make decisions based on the emotions where it's like the emotions should not be in the driver's seat. Like God should be in the driver's seat. And so we just need to bring the emotions up. Like they're just like the little signals in the car. Like, okay. Yeah. Oil check. You know what I mean? Like there's something we need to like check on real quick, but like, that's not what's driving the car, you know? And yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that's good. Well, I love you. I want to honor your time. And I feel like you're just going to have to come back on because there's so many things that we did not even get to. Um, but I love you so, so much. much. And I know that I, I was you. encouraged by it. So I know that our listeners, our viewers are encouraged by it too. And I want to give you a chance to shout out where they can find you. If you have any courses or life coaching or anything coming up, um, let them know where they can find you. Yeah. Um, well, right now I don't have courses available. I'm only offering one-on-one -on -one coaching, Amazing. which is my favorite. And if that's an interest, they can go to kristendaltonwolf.com. And my hub uh, on Instagram at Kristen J. Dalton is kind of a good place to just find everything. Perfect. Um, and then our family is on TikTok, the wolf family. So and cute. we have a lot of fun on there. Y'all are the cutest little fam ever. Chad and I Thank need to like you. make more fun reels and content and stuff, but it's so hard sometimes. I'm like, man, we just got to do it because it looks like y'all have so much fun doing it. We do. We do. Yeah. Well, I love y'all. I love y'all. I you love too. you and I love your family. Give them big hugs <laughs> for me. I miss your children so much. Um, Aww. But. Thank you for coming on Talks with Tori. Thanks for having me on. I'm so proud of you. Talks with Tori is going to slay. <laughs> I love you. Talk to you soon. Okay, friends. I hope that you were encouraged by that conversation in the same way that I was. I love her so, so much. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, to like, to subscribe, to share with a girlfriend that you might feel needs encouragement today. And also you will see in the description below, we have a link to, to subscribe to our email list. And I will just say talks with Tori is not just talks with Tori. We have some things working in the background and we'll be sharing that first with our email subscribers. So make sure that you sign up there and we will see you next Tuesday at two for another episode of talks with Tori. Love you guys. Adios.